Okay. Okay, good. Just give me the heads up when you're ready to roll. I'm going to mute everybody at this point. Muting all. Co hosts can unmute yourselves. Okay. Well, uh, hi everybody, glad you're here today. Uh, it's just really great to see all of you out. And uh, I heard that Sarah's uh, women's Bible study went really well and so glad to have that going now as well. It's very important for fellowship and uh, just really glad that uh, she has given of her time to do that. Um, today we're continuing in 2 Corinthians, and now we're in chapter 8. Get this little story I found. There were once two young men working their way through Leland Stafford, Stanford University. Their uh, funds got desperately low, and the idea came to one of them to engage Paderewski for a piano recital and devote the profits to their board and tuition. The great pianist manager asked for a guarantee of $2,000. The students, undaunted, proceeded to stage the concert. They worked hard, only to find that the concert had raised only $1,600. After the concert, the students sought the great artist and told him of their efforts and results. They gave him the entire $1,600 and accompanied it with a promissory note for $400, explaining that they would earn the amount at the earliest possible moment and send the money to him. No, replied Paderewski, that won't do. Then tearing the note to shreds, he returned the money and said to them, now take out of this $1,600 all of your expenses and keep for each of you 10% of the balance for your work and let me have the rest. The years rolled by, years of fortune and destiny. Paderewski had become premier of Poland. The devastating war came and Paderewski was striving with might and main to feed the starving thousands of his beloved in Poland. There was only one man in the world who could help Paderewski and his people. Thousands of tons of food began to come to Poland for distribution by the Polish premier. After the starving people were fed, Paderewski journeyed to Paris to thank Herbert Hoover for the relief sent him. That's all right, Mr. Paderewski, was Mr. Hoover's reply. Besides, you don't remember it, but you helped me once when I was a student at college and I was in a hole. <laughs> wow, <laughs> really something, it's a small world, isn't it? Well, you know what, Generos generosity should be the mark of true believers. It's interesting how sometimes the most generous people are those in great need themselves. He starts out this chapter, verse one, and now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave us as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we ex had expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earn earnestness, 
and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. <clears throat> Paul wanted to share with the churches in Macedonia what they were doing to encourage and stimulate the church at Corinth to similar action. The Christians in Macedonia had met with ill treatment from the world and also from some Jews and had become poor because of it. Yet out of these trials, they've learned the joy of the Lord and the joy of generosity. They learned to be joyous givers beyond their own ability to give. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You ever given something to somebody, money or food or something, and you have that feeling after you've done it? It's like, yeah, that's what it's like to be a cheerful giver. To be a cheerful giver, you have to have the freedom to give. This is why tithes were not commanded in the early church. Christians were to give according to their conviction to do so, because God does not love a giver who is forced to give, but a cheerful giver. Paul made it clear that the churches were to take up collections, as we studied earlier, but he didn't stress how much and was not going to tell them to give money to him, even if they helped him. Uh, even though they did help him and he accepted it, the Macedonians on their own asked Paul to be allowed to share in the ministry he and others were doing. They were eager to do so. You know, sometimes I don't see this eagerness in churches today. When missionaries come to churches today, they're often met with indifference. It used to be when we first went out to the mission field with my family in 1962. If you went to it to speak in a church, you were invited to speak in a church, they assumed you needed support and they gave it. These days I've been to churches where I go and speak and they go, thank you, see you later. <laughs> they don't even ask. But the church needs to support the ministries God has called people to do. Paul asked Titus, tasked Titus with talking to the Corinthians about giving. Paul says that they already excelled in faith, speech, knowledge, complete earnestness, and their love for us. But that they needed to excel in giving as well. Notice that there's a grace of giving. In fact, giving is listed as a spiritual gift. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And then the church God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles and those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Paul, as an apostle, was carrying out the duty of a Christian leader to prepare God's people for works of service, which includes giving. Going on to verse 8. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Again, the message from Paul about generosity is not a command. Otherwise, the people would not be giving cheerfully to the work of the Lord and to the poor. His goal was to get them to test their sincerity and love by comparing it to the Macedonian church. He wanted to challenge them to become more like the Macedonian Christians in this regard. Our example is Jesus Christ. He was rich in the sense of leaving his father's glory in heaven 
to come to earth, to have nothing, no place to lay his head. But that through this act of leaving his riches and glory, he would make many rich by dying for their sins and being raised from the dead. What an amazing thing. Ephesians 2, 6 through 7. And God raised us with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Verse 10. And here's my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager, eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. You know, sometimes we have eagerness to do something, but we don't complete it. We need to go all the way through. Verse 12, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Apparently, the year previous, the Corinthians had made a plan to give. This is a good thing. But you know, it needs to be carried through. Many churches make big plans, but are unable or unwilling to carry through on their commitment. Paul says that the willingness to give is the most important thing. As long as that remains strong, the amount of the gift is not as important. Think about the widow's might. Verse 13, our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. Paul wants the churches to give so they can share each other's burdens. This is important, especially in times of need. You know what? We're coming to that soon in our world, and the true churches will need to help one another. If one church is blessed with goods and money, then they should be helping the churches that are struggling. This does not mean that we help churches that are not obeying the Lord or heretical churches. But it does mean that we help those who are truly doing the Lord's work, especially. The meaning of the saying, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little, is that when a church has been blessed with much, they don't hoard it, but they share it so they do not have too much, which those who are going through struggles should rely on the Lord and not complain about their circumstance. Hebrews 13, 5, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. An important thing to remember these days. It's so true. The point is that we as believers are to share what we have with one another, particularly with those in need. We should follow the example of the early church. Acts 2.44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. You know, that's hard to do these days, harder than it used to be. Uh, island cultures are very much like the cultures in the first century and many other cultures in the world. And when you're living there, you realize that no one person has enough money to own everything to be self-sufficient, like we love to be in the U.S. So in the community, everyone could use what anyone, any one person has. I remember a pastor came up to me on a boat when we were on our way out to, uh, uh, you know, get to uh, go fishing. And uh, it, uh, he says, uh, 
give me your swim fins. <laughs> in uh, in Palau, uh, there is no word for please. <laughs> but uh, I knew it didn't bother me because I knew that if I needed something from him later on, that I could ask him and he would have no problem giving it to me. And sure enough, that's what happened later. I needed a spear gun and he gave me a spear gun to use as long as I wanted it. So that's how other cultures are. But today this principle applies to giving. If there's a missionary, a pastor, a poor person or a church in need that we can fellowship with, then the Lord will show us what we need to do to help. We need to be willing to help. Verse 16. I thank God who put into the heart of Titus uh, the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he's coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. And we are spending, we are sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. What is more, he's, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering, which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself and to show our eagerness to help. We want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift. For we're taking pains to do what's right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. So Paul was going to send Titus back to Corinth because Titus had an enthusiasm to help the church. Barnes says this about the unnamed person. It's been generally supposed that this anonymous brother was Luke. Some have supposed, however, it was Mark. Others that it was Silas or Barnabas. It's impossible to determine with certainty who it was, nor is it material to know whoever it was. It was someone well-known in whom the church at Corinth could have entire confidence. It's remarkable that though Paul mentions him again, 2 Corinthians 12, 18, he does it also in the same manner without specifying his name. <clears throat> well, it seems likely that that person was Luke, uh, because the people in Corinth knew him. I don't know why Paul didn't mention his name. Perhaps he had asked Paul not to write down his name, maybe because it was acknowledged that uh, what Paul was writing in his letters was scripture by Peter 10, late, 10 years later, but the churches were already passing it around as such. Second Peter 3.16 he, Paul, writes the same way in all his letters, speaking to them of these matters. His latter letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Paul's letters were already being understood to be scripture at the time of this letter. By the way, uh, it wasn't the Catholic Church that made them scripture <laughs> with the canon. No. These letters were already being passed around by the early church and considered to be scripture. The churches were treating Paul's letters along with the Gospels and Acts as scripture. And the only ones to be added later were John and Revelation, according to, to the commentaries. So Luke did possibly not want to intrude his name into scripture this way. Another possibility is that it was Mark since John Mark had gone with uh, Barnabas after he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work, perhaps Paul was still testing Mark to be sure he would be faithful, as he later proved himself to be. 2 Timothy 4.11, only Luke is with me, get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. In any case, it doesn't really matter who this person was, except for the fact that the churches had chosen him to carry their offerings to Jerusalem. So he apparently was a trustworthy person for them. Paul was again going to be careful not to involve himself 
with carrying money so that no one could accuse him of wrongdoing. This is why it's so important, this principle is so important for pastors and churches. They should not be the ones handling the money. It looks bad, and often it's a temptation. It becomes a temptation. The wise pastor will hire someone to do the books and take care of the money, someone who's trustworthy. So it's important to be a good example before God and before men. We must avoid evil, but also even the appearance of evil. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, abstain from all appearance of evil. So this is a principle that should be applied to all Christians, but particularly Christian leaders. They are to be a good example to the church and a representative of Christianity to the world. Verse 22, in addition, we are sending with them our brother who has often proved to us in many ways that he's zealous and now even more so because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he's my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brothers, they are representatives of the churches and an honor to Christ. Therefore, show these men the proof of your love and the reason for our pride in you so the, church, so that the churches can see it. Not only Titus had confidence in the Corinthian Christians, but the other man Paul was going to send also had confidence in them. It would not be good to send people to minister to the Corinthians at this time who were critical of them because they had just come back to the truth and made things right. You know what? This is another principle. You don't need to further rebuke at a time like that. If someone has re repented and turned around and changed their ways, it's not another time to continue to rebuke them. We have to be careful about that. The Corinthian church still needed to learn some things and stop doing some things they were doing, but they were now headed down the right road, and Paul wanted them to continue. Paul urged the church at Corinth to show the men he was sending to them love and the reason why Paul was proud of them. That's because he wanted them to be a good example to the churches from which these men came. Paul had already given a challenge to the Corinthian church by way of citing the example of the Macedonian churches and their generosity. He also wanted the Corinthian church to shine in the eyes of the Macedonians when Paul's fellow workers returned from their churches. That's, you know, <laughs> that's what he wanted. He want, wanted them to really shine in the eyes of other Christians at, at the time. Well, I'm going to, uh, that's the end, folks, uh, for today. Um, I'm going to allow you guys to unmute yourself.